Hello, and welcome to Star USA Training. Today is Tuesday, May 23rd, and we'll be talking about the path to becoming a licensed customs broker. We're recording this webinar. The slides and recording and any other materials will be made available after the broadcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link to our website for materials in the description of the video. All participants are muted, but the question and answer feature is available if you have any questions. I'll answer questions you ask throughout and take more at the end if there's time. There is one NCBFAA credit available for continuing education credits. The code will be provided at the end of the webinar and in the email we send out with the recording. So we have a joke at Star USA about how no one intends to work in this field. We all sort of stumble into it. I fell into it when I moved to Ohio for the first time. I took a short-term data entry job that morphed into a long-term job that worked on data entry, audit of entries, and software development assistance while I went to school for my master's in social work. I worked in social work for a while. Then I came back here to STAR working on audits for import activity. I also worked with STAR's founder, Peggy Easton, on the Customs Broker License Exam Prep Course Administration. I personally love a challenge, and when I heard that the test had really low pass rates, I decided I might take it. I took the course that Peggy taught and the test, which I passed, and then I moved on to managing clients, and then managing staff, and now I'm in my current role where I work in regulatory and training. I'm a really big nerd, but you don't have to be one to be a broker. I really like making complex pieces fit together. But again, you don't have to have that to benefit from a broker's license. I do hope that you will ask questions as we go along. I like this webinar to be a little more informal. I like this to be an opportunity for you to get career advice as you're going through. Star USA is a consulting advice, training, and services firm in the field of international trade and compliance. We are based out of Northeast Ohio, and for the past few decades, we've provided an array of services to importers, exporters, brokers, carriers, and forwarders of different sizes and skill levels. That box at the bottom should say that it starts June 29th, 2023. We were founded on the premise that knowledge is power. We really believe that sharing our experience can help you improve and strengthen yourself as an individual while providing value to your organization. I believe really strongly in being a good citizen of whatever community you're a part of. And as part of the trade compliance community, we find a lot of value in helping other people become great brokers and valuable members of that community. Our course starts in about a month. Keep in mind, we have the Peggy Easton Scholarship where we give away the tuition of the course. I'll remind you at the end of the webinar and I'll send the link to the application when we email out the recording. My name is Joe Harper. I am a principal with STAR. I have my customs broker license and I've been working in this industry for over a decade. Just like every career being a licensed customs broker, has its ups and downs. We think it's a super cool career path. It's very interesting. If you are already a trade compliance professional, then you have enough interest in knowing what's involved. As a licensed customs broker, that license is a valuable credential and it gives you membership into an elite group of professionals. Trade compliance people are a unique bunch that work hard and have a lot of fun. There's a shortage of licensed customs brokers everywhere. This much knowledge and responsibility is important to a lot of companies. It makes you incredibly valuable. And going after something that difficult shows that you're ambitious and motivated. Many compliance professionals find that getting a license leads to increased earning potential. Average income varies by state. Entry level, you often start around $50,000 a year. And then as you move into management, then you end up in the low six figures. The state statistics are a little outdated, but their average information is pretty accurate. 
I believe Florida's is so much lower because there's a lot of border crossing that happens there. There's a lot of job security in licensed brokerage. Many of the jobs are not for customs brokerage firms that you might think of, but they're for importers or exporters who want someone on staff who's that knowledgeable. The Customs Modernization Act and 15 CFR make it companies' responsibility to follow the laws and know what they're doing and make sure their company is compliant. A customs brokerage firm often does the work of filing the entries and interfacing with those government agencies and figuring out the automated broker interface, which is a huge pain. But the jobs that are available tend to be with specific companies who are legally responsible for their own activities. And they benefit from having the knowledgeable attention of an expert focused solely on their operations and providing advice about what they can do. The past few years have seen a big change in the labor market. A lot of professionals who've worked in the industry for decades have retired, and there is high demand for trained compliance professionals. Companies know that government agencies are stepping up enforcement, and they want to be prepared. Here's a simplified guide to getting your license. Not everyone does this first step on making the decision, but we find it that it is extremely valuable. Finding your reasons why you want to become a licensed customs broker is helpful for down the road when it gets tough and you don't want to study. You can come back to that. It will motivate you to keep going. Anytime that you do something difficult, you're going to experience doubt along the way. And spending time at the beginning running through why you're doing something allows you to make good decisions, reorient yourself along the way, and evaluate when something is working for you and when it isn't. You also want to tell other people and build a support system. The best predictor I've seen in success in our course is having other people that you can talk with and having the space in your day-to-day life to let you devote time to it. We've started offering study buddies in our course so that you can develop professional contacts along the way. And having that other person who is walking the difficult road with you, who knows what you're going through and you can bounce ideas off of, is extremely valuable to our students. I know I joked at the beginning of the webinar about taking the exam solely because I like doing hard things. And that is sort of true, but I also had a six-month-old baby at home when I was studying for the exam and taking the exam, and I was not sleeping a lot. So having reasons why I was doing it and seeing value in getting my license was extremely important for letting me spend the time consistently as I went. We really recommend having a prep course. The exam is only offered twice a year. It's offered in April and October. So you don't get to take it and then retake it again quickly. You have to wait six months before you can take it again. Having a prep course and an instructor is extremely valuable because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You do not have to have one. You can pass the exam on your own, but it is such a unique exam that having the knowledge of the content and the skills to approach the exam is super helpful. If you find a course, it should be three to six months before the exam, depending on how great you are at taking tests. And then find a course that has lessons that you can do on demand, that you can talk with the instructor, that has resources that will make flipping through your references easier, practice exams, and group discussions are really, really valuable. Then you need to get your resources together. It is an open book, open note test. The Customs Broker License Exam is. And you can take any written materials you want. There's no electronic devices. Testing sites provide you with a calculator, but for some people that's kind of intimidating because some of their calculators can be overly complicated. You need to have the HTSUS, an updated copy of Title 19, two ACE documents, the ACE Entry Summary Business Rules and Process document and the ACE Entry Summary Instructions that replaced 
the Customs Form 7501 and its instruction, and the Right to Make Entry Directive. Those are the references that we've seen in the last five years of the exam, but sometimes Customs will ask a question that requires an additional reference, and then they'll tell you in the required references list. A huge part of our prep course is aimed at making sure that our students organize their references and are very familiar with them. You should be familiar with your books, not just having a copy of them, because the timing aspect of the test means that you have to have your references organized so you can quickly flip to the right spot. This list of five items is thousands of pages long. If you stack all of those papers on top of each other, it's more than a foot high. It is a lot of information. When I took the test, we were still testing at government buildings and I walked in. I'd been working on this for six months. I had a suitcase full of testing materials and I was extremely intimidated. And there were several people in line with me who had plastic wrapped copies of 19 CFR that they had never cracked open. They were going in to take the exam. I passed, they did not pass. You need to have a lot of familiarity with your references. Then you want to study. In the months leading up to the exam, you will spend most of your free time studying. We find that students that successfully pass spend about 20 hours a week studying and practicing your tests. And that's why you really need to know why you're doing this and what you're going to get out of it so that you have something to hold on to when you really just want to go watch TV instead. The exam is 80 questions, and those questions can cover any topics from the regulations in HTS, and they usually pinpoint very specific lines of references, not big concepts. So you have to familiarize yourself with the testing style and the content. Customs has a really particular way of asking questions, and there's a lot of tricks in there. So you need to learn those. Then register for the exam. This exam has a complicated sign-up process. Customs posts the notice of examination and gives you about a two-month window to sign up for the test. And that window closes 30 days before the exam. A few years ago, they raised the license exam fee from $200 to $390. You sign up for the exam and make your payment, and then shortly after, an email notifies you that it's time for site selection, and you can select the testing site that's most convenient for you. Space in those sites is limited, so you select it early. The test is administered by third-party testing services like Pearson View or PSI, and there are often test takers on site that are testing for other careers, and there won't be any customs officers present. Some companies reimburse you for the exam if you are working for them. Some will even pay for your prep course and your materials, which is great. When you sign up for the exam, you need to make sure that you use the name that is on your identification because you need to bring multiple forms of ID with you to the exam so the site knows you are who you say you are and your name has to exactly match what's on that identification. Then take the exam. It is electronic. They moved it off of paper five-ish years ago, and that change made the passing rates lower. It is difficult to test on a computer, and that is what we spend a lot of time practicing in our course. It's 80 questions and takes about four and a half hours. It is also offered remotely in addition to those contracted testing sites. The remote exam, first of all, has a lot of technical issues. I have never had a person that I know who has taken that exam who has not had serious issues testing. The exam is already hard enough and short enough. You do not need to add throwing yourself off by your computer freezing or the connection with customs going down. And while you test remotely, there is a customs officer watching your camera the whole time as you test. If you have to take it remotely, it is an option, but it will cost you some points 
So think about that in your evaluation. You can get additional time added to the four and a half hours if you have documented disabilities or learning disorders that require additional time. You just need to work with customs on that. The exam starts at 8.30 a.m. local time. I always recommend to our students that you show up at least an hour early. So you can use the bathroom. You have time to get searched. Make sure you don't have anything on you that you're not allowed to take. Set up your references, grab a quick snack and a drink of water, and then lock up everything else. Once you're finished testing, some sites will let you leave. Others will require that you stay until everyone who is taking the exam is done testing. It usually happens on the fourth Wednesday in April and October. The next one is scheduled for October 25th, 2023. After you take the exam, you're not allowed to discuss it until after midnight on the day of testing. That's the way that customs gets around testing happening in multiple time zones. Then wait for your results. Customs sends you, either emails you or prints out a list of your answers as you test. After you're done, you can't bring a copy of the test out with you, but you can bring your answers out with you. Customs usually posts a copy of the exam two weeks after the test, and then they'll post their answer key a week or two after that. They will also then email you your score before they post the answer key. So you'll know which ones you got correct and which ones you did not. You can use that to prepare any protests that you may want to file if you don't pass the exam. If you are within a couple questions of passing, there are usually questions in the exam that you can say, hey, listen, this question either was inaccurate or is contradictory, or wasn't fair. There on the most recent exam, the April 2023 exam, there's a classification question, and it is asking you where a wood purse is classified, a wood handbag. And they offered several items in 4202, which covers the classification of backpacks, purses, and the like. And then they offered a classification in 4221, which is a heading that does not exist. Turns out that was a typo and they meant 4421, which is wood articles. That was the classification that was their answer, but there was a typo in that question that made it so you could not choose that answer. That question should be protestable. Then you wanna submit a broker's license application. Once you pass the exam, you can apply for the license to take the exam, you only have to be 18, but you have to be 21 to get a license. So you have three years from passing the exam to apply for your license, but you have to apply within three years. You wanna to apply to the port where you are going to transact customs business as a broker. Your local port is the best bet. And the application fee is $200 plus a fingerprint check and processing fees. The application process is pretty intense. The form itself that you fill out isn't too robust, but there are a lot of things that need to go with it. You need to have a fingerprint analysis. You need to provide character references. I have never had customs contact character references, but they do occasionally, so provide them. They do not have to be professional references. They really are just, hey, is this person a decent human? Are they likely to commit a crime? You need to include credit reports, and if you have any arrest records, include that. The license application, once you submit it, goes through multiple levels of review. The background investigation runs through several agencies. Then customs port director is going to review it and forward their recommendations, and then headquarters will say yes or no. Then it will go back to the port if headquarters approves proceeding and the port will contact you to set up an interview. That interview is usually just, hey, do you swear you told the truth? Is there anything that we're missing? Can you confirm these things? Customs tries really hard to issue licenses within six months of the time of application, but it can depend. Some of the factors are how complete the application was, how many different places the applicant lived, 
any arrest records they have to work through, how busy that port is. Usually it's around six months, but if you haven't heard, you can reach out to customs. And then once your license is issued, man, celebrate the heck out of it. It is really hard to do that. And getting that kind of professional credential is a huge win. And you should be extremely proud of yourself. Then you have to maintain it. Every few years, you have to complete the triennial status report to maintain your license. The next one's due in 2024. After that, it's due February 1st, 2027, and then in 2030. The license is infinite, but there's update steps that you have to take and rules around how you can lose your license. Customs is working through a lot of changes right now in the customs broker modernization detail. One change that just happened is there are no longer district permits. Everyone has a national permit. They are also talking about potentially requiring continuing education units for licensed brokers every few years. That would be reported on your triennial status report. So if you are a licensed broker who doesn't work with customs every day, you should still keep your ear to the ground and make sure you know what you need to be doing. The exam is terrifying to a lot of people. And I will not lie to you, it is hard. It is intentionally hard. They want to weed out licensed applicants who are not able to navigate a really complex and constantly changing world of customs. Being a broker is hard. Taking the exam is also hard, but it is hard in a different way. It's really difficult to design something that exactly reflects the environment you'll be working in, and the exam does not do that. The customs broker exam is a hurdle that you have to pass. People often think that an 80 multiple choice question exam won't take four and a half hours or that it's going to be pretty easy because it's open book. It should take you that long. And it is that hard. Even when I take the exam after it's put out and I have access to control F searchable references to look things up, I still get questions wrong when I am taking it. And I've been working in prep for the exams for over a decade. To pass, you have to answer 60 questions correctly. A passing score is 75% or higher. Again, it's only offered twice a year. So if you studied like crazy for the April exam and you didn't pass the April exam, you have to wait six months before you can take it again. And it's hard to stay current and keep up your motivation for another six months. You have to bring specific references that customs requires or use their built-in electronic references. The electronic resources are not agile. We strongly recommend bringing paper references and that you've opened them before the exam. Customs also strongly recommends bringing paper references. They sent out multiple emails saying, don't trust our electronic references. In the October 2022 exam, those electronic references crashed testing sites because it's such a huge volume of information you should plan on them being unusable. So that's a way that the exam differs from real life because in real life, Google is your friend and phoning a friend is very helpful. You can't do that in the exam. There is no limit on how many times you can take the exam, but again, it's only offered every six months and it costs $400 to take it. So you want to pass it. It usually covers topics like entry, classification, free trade agreements, value, broker compliance, powers of attorney, marking of origin, ACE, drawback, bonds, quota, FTZs, and bonded warehouse, intellectual property rights, and fines, penalties, and forfeitures. The April exam also included questions on partner government agencies, which is a great topic to add. It is a hard test. An average of the past two decades shows a pass rate a little under 15%. So roughly 3,000 people take the exam each year. Only around 400, 450 people pass annually. And that's on average. The April 2023 exam had a 5.5% pass rate. 
but you can pass if you prepare properly. Those pass rates terrified me when I was going to take the exam. And then I got there and I saw how little other people had prepared. If you work as a broker and you work in the regulations all of the time, maybe you wouldn't have to prepare. But again, the way they ask questions is so unique. And the way the exam is structured is so unique. And taking a test on a computer is hard. And taking standardized tests is difficult. So if you are someone who gets freaked out by standardized tests, that is a hurdle that you have to overcome to move into this career, which kind of stinks. We have a lot of tips on how to pass. Peggy has been working and helping people pass the broker's exam for 50 years. This is something that we find a lot of value in. And even when we have years where we don't teach the full course, we are still mentoring people through passing the exam. So we've done this for a really long time, and it's something we are extremely passionate about. First tip, familiarize yourself with the material, but don't even try to memorize it. Do not waste your time. Again, a foot and a half of full-size paper printed edge to edge. That's too much, but you should be familiar with it. You should have highlights. You should have tabs. And review past exams to figure out what kinds of questions are asked the most and where customs sends you for the answers. Then organize your material. This will save you a lot of time on the exam. Remember, it's timed. So you have about three minutes a question. And there are questions that are a lot harder that you're going to need more like 10 or 15 minutes. So being able to quickly find the area that you need to go to is essential. Buy a catalog rack to hold all your documents, use tabs and labels. If you don't do a catalog rack, use big three ring binders. Those are extremely helpful. And then be strategic with your highlights. Don't highlight everything. Some people like color coded highlights. I never ended up doing that because I ran out of highlighters, so I had to just use whatever color that I had to call information out, but it might be helpful to have color coding. One of the largest parts of the exam is HTS classification, so practice classifying a lot. You should have the GRIs memorized. Those are found at the beginning of the general notes in the HTS. Always check section and chapter notes in the HTS so that you find exclusions and definitions. Check out Customs Informed Compliance Publications or their NCSD webinars. They are extremely helpful. Also, read customs rulings. I would say three questions each exam come from recent customs rulings. You want to get an idea of the way customs thinks about classification. Understand value. Even though the section on value is small, the concepts spill into practical exercises, entry, ACE, and other areas. If you are focusing on the biggest bang for your buck, you want to look at transaction value and understand when it applies and when it doesn't fully comprehend assists, and know when fees like harbor maintenance fee and merchandise processing fee apply. You should be extremely familiar with the ACE entry instructions. This used to be Customs Form 7501 instructions. The ACE entry instructions and the ACE business rules and process document is something that you should fully understand. Know how to read a customs entry Often questions on the exam under the entry section will show a picture of a partially fill out form and ask you to fill in the blanks or show you a section of an entry and ask you questions about the context that you will need to be able to recognize. Start studying months before the exam. You do not have to study every day, but just like learning a musical instrument, repetition is key and you can build on past knowledge and improve. Take those practice exams. Customs offers every pass exam and answers to the public. I recommend only practicing with tests from the past three to four years because some of the information goes out of date. Regulations change. And if you're practicing old exams against current regulations, you're going to get questions wrong. 
Our course has all of the exams from the past 10 years. We try to update the questions to current regs, and we also put them in a computer system so that you can take those tests electronically the way that they would be when you are actually testing. It's important to practice the environment that you will be taking the real exam in. We also recommend a prep course. Our prep course is awesome. Other prep courses are great as well. Our course is really time consuming and will take your attention in order to be successful. It's about 17 weeks. It starts June 29th. So in the summer, it has been successful for a very long time. It is administered by a licensed customs broker, has a very organized course schedule, comprehensive practice tests structured like the official customs exam with many questions coming from past customs exams. You have access to past exams, very thorough study guides, and exam references. Remember that you want to move through your references quickly. So having references that help you identify forms quickly or time limits or penalty amounts is extremely nice instead of having to dig through your references, flip back and forth and compare. Our webinars are on demand. We also do live review sessions so that you can ask questions. Our materials help you understand the tariffs and regs, lots of past exam questions, and we do a lot of communication on a messaging platform so that you can ask questions at any time of day and talk with other students. Our past students are fantastic. I always feel so lucky to get to work with them. And I love seeing them then out in the trade community. One thing that I love about doing the course online is that we can work with students all over the United States. So anytime I go to a conference, I'm likely to run into someone who has unfortunately had to listen to hours and hours of my voice. But I love getting to see our past students succeed in the industry and become amazing compliance professionals. The materials are not included with the course, but we provide recommended materials to purchase from independent vendors. Our course covers a ton of topics on items that you will see on the exam, but most importantly, it covers what you will need to be a good broker which is more important, ultimately extremely important in your daily life. Covers how to file protests, customs broker requirements, regulations with Canada and Mexico, ACE details. Our course is not the cheapest, but it is extremely comprehensive. We care a lot about our students doing well. We give you access to the course until you pass the exam. So you can continue to use the course until you pass. We use an instant messaging platform as a member only community and chat platform. So our past students have formed relationships that go on to serve them extremely well in their career. And you can also receive certified custom specialist credits through the NCBFAA, which is a great way to complete all of your CEUs for a year. We recommend that you register by July 5th for the October prep course. And then we have a number of resources that will help you in your journey to be an awesome licensed customs broker. The Customs Bulletin is a weekly publication where CBP publishes information that customs brokers need to be aware of. So it includes updates to the regulations, customs rulings that overwrite past rulings, any court cases that are relevant. So you'll see court cases on things like anti-dumping, classification, sometimes resolving conflicts between an importer and customs on whether something is protestable or not. Then 19 CFR, which is where the customs broker regulations and most import regulations are found. The Notice of Customs Broker License Examination, that website has a ton of information on the exam and on topics that customs needs you to know about for the exam. Then there's CBP's Customs Broker site and the Customs Broker Modernization webpage. 
Both of those are useful for periodically staying updated. And if you want to test out an exam to see what you're getting yourself into, there are past customs broker license exams for about the last five exams posted on customs website. So you can take an exam and compare your answers to what customs had. Thanks for attending. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. If you want to have a more private communication, feel free to email us, train at starusa.org. There is an NCB FAA CCS credit available. We'll send an instruction letter out to everyone when we send the recording and materials, or you can take the completion code that is on screen and enter that into your NEI interface. We have a Peggy Easton scholarship that will be emailed out with the slides and the recording. So what that does is it covers the cost of the course and you apply by talking about why you want to be a licensed customs broker. Peggy reviews all of the applicants and we have incredible applicants and I love reading the stories. And then we're able to award a scholarship to the course for a user, which is wonderful. We have a question on if we have separate modules for HTS classification only. We do offer HTS classification training separately from the customs broker course. Yes. And that's one that we love to do. It's a lot of fun. For the Title 19 Code of Federal Regulations, you need parts 0 to 199. There's also a part that the International Trade Administration has. You don't need that. You just need 0 to 199 for the exam. Our passing rate for students who pass our course is about 90%. So it's very good passing rate if you take the course and you pass it and you are successful in the course. Deadline to sign up for the October exam prep course is July 5th. There will be an intro session for the course that opens June 29th, but you can come in and do that again later. Question about the trends that we're seeing in the exam. In the exam, Customs is focusing more on ACE and the ACE business rules and process document. They are also adding questions in areas like intellectual property rights. They've asked a few questions on forced labor, and they have asked questions on partner government agencies. There are more categories on the exam. So you have to be aware of a broader swath of the regulations. The fee for the course is $2,450, and that is for the prep course. We do offer one-on-one -on -one help before and during the course. You can sign up for the tutor package, which is also on the website that has information on the Customs Broker course, and that comes with one-on-one -on -one help during the course. Last day to sign up while awaiting the scholarship results is July 5th. We will send out information on the scholarship before intro session, before June 29th. So the last day to apply for the scholarship is June 1st. I'll confirm that in the email though. You can get materials for the exam online. There are a number of vendors that sell them. And the ACE Entry Summary Business Rules and Process Document, the ACE Entry Summary Instructions, and the Customs Directive 3530002 are all available on Customs website free. You just need to print those out. You can also purchase the HTS and 19 CFR from the government printing office. I don't tend to recommend it because it takes a very long time to get them. So there are other vendors that we tend to recommend more highly. We do not currently offer a training on customs entry writing. There is training on the entries as part of the customs broker course. The course material that answers information about CBSA and Mexican customs does not go into their specific regulations. It goes into the way that our regulations dovetail with the other countries' regulations. We do not teach on Canada and Mexico customs regs. They're often similar and have a lot of overlap, but they are also different. 
The fee for the course does not include paper copies of the reference materials. It does include electronic copies that you can use and print out if you would like to do that. But generally, we find it's more cost effective and ink effective for people to order them from other vendors. There is a discount for NCBFAA members of about 15% if you want to email us and let us know. So there's a question about taking the exam as a permanent resident. Let me confirm. I have 19 CFR pulled up, so I'm going to take just a minute. You have to be a citizen of the U.S. to take the exam. So you cannot be a permanent resident. 19 CFR 111.13b says in order to take the exam, you must on the date of the exam be a citizen of the United States. Unfortunately, you cannot take the exam as a permanent resident and get a license once you are a citizen. For the materials, the HTS and the CFR, it's usually around $400. You can often get binders for that cost as well. For the scholarship, we will send out a link to the website. There is a form on the website that you can complete. You are welcome to take the prep course if you are not a U.S. citizen, as long as you know that you cannot take the exam until you're a U.S. citizen. For the course, we have a recorded lesson that goes live every Thursday. And then there are tons of study material practice questions and a weekly exam that you can take at your own time. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I hope you have a great day. I hope you learned something about being a licensed customs broker. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Have a fantastic rest of your day.